Kia ora koukou, no mai haramai to tonight's webinar. I'm Katie McCulloch, I'm a nurse practitioner working for the Goodfellow Unit. Tonight's webinar is part of a series of webinars titled Te Tiri Whakaaro, Sharing Knowledge. It's commissioned by Te Whatu Ora to support primary care and there are three sections to tonight's webinar. Tonight's webinar is going to be covering, covering DEXA scanning with Dr. Sunita Paul. She's going to be providing an overview on how to best use a DEXA service and ankle fractures. Dr. Guy Melrose will present an urgent care take on how to assess and manage ankle fractures. And our standing segment of clinical updates will be covered by Dr. Sue Tati. Tonight's speakers include Dr. Sunita Paul. She's a consultant geriatrician at Counties Monaco. And Guy Melrose, Guy's an urgent care physician who works cl cl clinically in Tauranga. He's the Director of Professional Development for the Royal New Zealand College of Urgent Care and a Professional Teaching Fellow at the University of Auckland within both the Department of General Practice and Primary Care and the Department of Anesthesiology. And we've got Dr. Sue Tutte, she's a Primary Care Advisor and the, the, the lead on this um, Te Tiri Whakaro series. All right, we're ready to start. Over to you, Sunita. I'm a geriatrician at Middlemore Hospital and I've been running the falls and osteoporosis services there as part of my orthogeriatric role for the last 24 years. Um, and the talk today is mainly from my perspective uh, of uh, being a practitioner at counties. So you'll have to keep that in mind. Um, although I understand uh, you're all from different parts of the country, I'm just going to talk to you about how best to use uh, DEXA service. And I, I'm going to talk about it from the public uh, service point of view. Yeah. So um, as you guys are all aware that um, DEXA service provision is very variable across the country. And as far as I know, there are only a handful of um, hospitals, public hospitals that provide the service. At counties, we are very lucky. We've had the DEXA service in place for the past uh, almost um, 20 years almost, I would think. Yeah, 2004 we started. So um, DEXA, is, uh, DEXA is just a dual energy absorption meter which measures bone density. Um, it has very low exposure to radiation, so it's fairly safe. The, real, the only real contraindication is um, pregnancy. So we don't do DEXA training for patients that are pregnant. Um, the slide that uh, is on at the moment just uh, is exactly what goes out to the patients as an information um, uh, sort of uh, piece of information for the patients. And essentially, it takes about 20 minutes for older pa patients because it takes time to position them correctly. So for younger patients, it takes a shorter time. Um, so the next couple of slides, which I won't go into, just tell you a little bit about a history of evolution of DEXA service at counties. And the only reason you probably need to know that is so that you can understand the variation of service provision across the country. So indications for DEXA. So who should, who should have their bone density measured? Essentially, anybody you think is at risk of osteoporosis. So I'll take you through the risk of osteoporosis. But really, patients that are 50 years or older, and if they have a minimal trauma fracture, um, such as neck of femur, wrist, pelvis, spine, um, tibial plateau, neck of humerus, these patients should have a DEXA. Um, ankle, is all, ankle is a bit of a controversial issue. So in younger overweight patients, ankle fractures are not considered osteoporotic. And uh, again, there's a bit of variation across the country about that indication. Nose fractures, metatarsal fractures, um, uh, finger fractures, clavicle fractures, these are also not considered to be typically uh, osteoporotic fractures. Um, and as you know, patients who are 75 years or older can actually go ahead um, with treatment if they have a minimal trauma fracture because it's very unlikely that they will have normal bone density. And that was in fact the basis for uh, the funding criteria previously for bisphosphonate therapy, which are no longer in place. Um, so anybody with a risk factors such as being on steroids, um, hypoparathyroidism, hypopituitarism, anybody who's got uh, anti 
uh, hormonal treatment going on, such as anti-androgen or anti-estrogen treatments, such as patients who have, who have breast cancer, uh, and so on. Now, when we first started the service at counties, we used to be able to accommodate requests for perimenopausal screening. We can no longer do that. And that's essentially because we have become so busy in the last three to four years since fractal liaison service expanded. And I'll again take you through that. So we've, ha we've had to really uh, become quite strict with accepting referrals. Um, so you'll have to forgive us when you get um, replies from us to say we are not able to offer perimenopausal screening. Um, that's just really not possible anymore for us. And I'm happy to qu take questions later on. So this slide just takes you through exactly what I've just told you about the indications for bone density. Uh, the other time, other than uh, risk factors, the other time we suggest bone density is when you're considering a uh, drug holiday. So if patients have been on bisphosphonate therapy, either Fosamax for five years or IV zolidronate three infusion, and you want to then decide what to do, whether to carry on or not, that's the other time when we do a DEXA. Um, or if a patient has a uh, fracture while on therapy, then we need to decide if we could escalate therapy to 40 years. So those are the times when we uh, offer DEXA service other than the first time, which is for risk factors and for diagnosis osteoporosis, diagnosing osteoporosis. Um, now, this, is, this slide is kindly provided by Sue because we used to have referrals faxed to us. Now they're e-referral. And this was our referral form, uh, essentially, that gave you cues about what we needed to see on the referral form, which is essentially the reason you're asking for bone density, which should be at least one high risk other than age. So we're not able to just do age-related. Um, uh, another, another reason is people who are recurrent fallers, frail elderly people who are recurrent fallers, and you want to risk stratify their fractures. So that's, that's another time where we can ask for a DEXA. And that's what our form used to look like. It was available on Health Point, by, by the way. Our DEXA service is actually not just a bone density reporting service. It's also an advisory service. So those of you who receive my reports will know that we use it to give you advice on treatment, uh, follow-up sometimes, and so on. So uh, when do we do a de Normally, when we do a DEXA, we do a DEXA of the spine and the hip, um, because those the bone density in the spine and hip is predictive of fractures. The, the, there are times when we need to do a risk uh, bone density measurement, and these are when we cannot rely on spine or hip if they've got metal wear. The other time we do risk is uh, hyperparathyroidism because uh, you might have uh, early hyperparathyroidism. You could have normal bone density in spine and hip but it will be quite reduced in the risk. So they will do it. We used to do risk previously when the funding criteria for bisphosphonate therapy were quite strict and we somehow needed to get the funding criteria. We no longer need to do that. Um, so that's just for you guys, for you to know, sometimes you see a risk uh, measurement and why is that. Um, so who should have uh, a re-scan, as I said, um, Patients who've been on bisphosphonate therapy, either for some X five years or three IVA cluster infusion, and you need to decide what to do next, or if they've had a new fracture and you're looking at escalation of therapy to 40 year, and monitoring while on steroids. So if patients haven't gone on treatment and are on, because they have bone density is so good, they haven't started bisphosphonate therapy um, and you're monitoring it, that would be a reason. And sometimes we do bone density for patients who are over 75, cannot have bisphosphonate therapy and are considering denosumab because you need to be fairly sure you're treating osteoporosis. So that, was, that would be the time where, where we would uh, recommend repeating a bone density. Um, now, the next two slides are from, uh, kindly provided by Sue again, and that's just really to show you the variation in pathways. So we are somewhere here, county, so we receive uh, e-referrals that are addressed to older person service. And that's historical because osteoporosis services were started under our orthogeriatric umbrella. So that's where the pathway has sat. As a, and as you can see, various other DHPs, or well, we don't call them DHPs anymore, but various other hospitals have different pathways. And that's the reason really. And that's where the history comes in. As far as I know, 
Auckland Hospital has a publicly funded uh, DEXA now. I think Vitamata now has a DEXA. We have a DEXA. Canterbury has a DEXA. And that's all I know. Those are the hospitals I know have a publicly funded DEXA. There are many other pathways to get a funded DEXA, and ACC is one of them. And of course, now most uh, hospitals or DHBs, in the, as we used to call them, have what we call fracture liaison service. And though the fracture liaison service has access to funded DEXA through most hospitals now, and I'll, I'll tell you a little bit more about it. Um, so, so this is again Sue's try, um, slide where she's trying to sort of guide you about how best to use DEXA service in your particular area um, and the things to keep in mind. Um, you might have to use a PHO pathway. Some of the DHPs have got ACC funding and then I think Fracture liaison service is probably the commonest way to get to um, uh, a funded service other than counties where we have a direct DEXA service pathway. So just taking you through how, how concerned should you be about dentition? My practice is that um, if people have got loose teeth, if they've got history of jaw radiation, or if they've actually got an ap active dental abscess, then I stop and get a dental check. Otherwise, really, it's not a big concern unless patients are on very frequent bisphosphonate therapy, like for cancer treatment. And the, this particular article that I've quoted in my slide is a very good one to read um, about dentition and need for dental in, uh, involvement, because, of course, the concern is a very rare side effect for osteonecrosis of the jaw and bisphosphonate therapy. It really is quite rare. Uh, the risk of osteoporotic fracture is much greater. Um, and there's also the screening and intervention strategies available through various dental um, websites. But this particular article is a good one. So like I said, I don't worry too much unless someone's got an active dental disease going on, such as an abscess, loose tooth, or if they've had jaw radiation, then, then I would get them to get a dental check. The other thing, of course, is if somebody's got impending um, major dental work coming up or implants, then I would let them have that first and then go on with the bisphosphonate therapy or at last time and so on. So who should have vitamin D? Well, anybody you're gonna start on bisphosphonate therapy should have it. I don't actually check vitamin D level because it's much more expensive to check. I just give them 50,000 units of calciferol stat and monthly. If, they're, if you think they are likely to be very deficient such as housebound people, then I give them two stat and one monthly. And of course, patients that are particularly at risk are people who wear, um, who have covered skin, dark skin, frail elderly, and housebound. Management of osteoporosis now. Um, there's a link at the end of the slides that the universe, the uh, Goodfellow unit has provided, and I think it's on the health pathways as well, which gives you a very good access to a very good article recently by Dr. David Kim, who's an endocrinologist at Vitamata. It's an excellent article on management of osteoporosis with scenarios discussed, et cetera. And I won't take you through too much detail, but I'll just touch upon a few issues. And I'm again, happy to take questions. So when you're considering treatment for osteoporosis, um, you need to think about what it is that you want to treat. And it's really fracture risk that you want to treat. So bone density is only part of the story. What you want to know is what is, the, what is the fracture risk of the patient in front of you? And there's at least three tools here you can use. In New Zealand, you can use FRAX. FRAX underestimates fracture risk for people who are fallers. So I would recommend using Garvin because that includes the history of falls. Q factor is available in UK. It's not available to us. So I haven't used it. FRAX Plus has recently become available um, in Australia. It's not available to us yet, which takes into account things like fall, uh, history of falls and something else called trivicular bone scores. Now that's mentioned in that link in the, in the article that I just mentioned to you at the end. So it's well worth your time reading, going through that article. You also want to correct reversible risk factors. So you want to look at their lifestyle, stop smoking, reduce alcohol, regular exercise, uh, look at their nutrition. And often I will mention that in my uh, report, the patient, somebody has nutritional, somebody has low body weight, and I'll mention, please do a nutritional assessment and intervention because that's a huge deal. And also you want to think about 
is the treatment justified? So if you've got a patient who's got less than one year of lifespan, I'm not very sure whether uh, osteoporosis treatment is a priority for those patients because remember the treatment uh, graphs themselves take about six months to separate. So do think about what it is that you want to treat and lifespan is very much part of that story. And of course, uh, things like follow-up, et cetera. So in terms of treatment, osteoporosis New Zealand provides a very good algorithm. I'm not going to take you through it. This is just in the slide for you guys to have a look at. And then there's a further slide that talks about follow-up, when to consider drug holiday, which is essentially with bisphosphonate therapy, if they've had Fosamax for five years, or if they've had three Eclasta infusions, which I try to recommend uh, 12 to 18 months to begin with. And once they've had a drug holiday, then maybe 18 to 20 month interval. Um, the big deal with bisphosphonates, of course, is to make sure their renal function is adequate. So creatinine clearance of 35 mils or less is um, 35 mils or more, uh, they need to have that. If it's less than 35, then uh, zoledronate is contraindicated. Fosamax, sometimes you can get away with reduced dose up to 25 to 30 mils. But uh, under that, I just don't give bisphosphonate therapy. Um, if you have to escalate treatment, so if patients have had a fracture while on bisphosphonate therapy and have a T-score of minus three or less, then they can be escalated to 40 or 40 or is teraparatide. Uh, actually, I'll take you to the next uh, slide. This is the article I was talking to you about. Uh, it's well worth a read. So um, I'll take you. Uh, yeah. So 40 is an escalation therapy available in New Zealand or PTH. It's an analog. It's given us a subcut daily injection for 18 months. The thing to remember with Fortio is that just before you're about to finish Fortio, it's better to restart for some max or IV zoledronate. Otherwise, they re lose bone density very rapidly uh, and then request a repeat DEXA to decide what to carry on with. Um, what else can I tell you about uh, Fortio? So bisphosphonate therapy is anti-resorptive therapy. Fortio is osteoblast-enhancing therapy. Denosumab is a medication that can be used uh, if patients have renal impairment. Denosumab is only funded for patients who've got renal impairment and have had a first further fracture and cannot have bisphosphonate ther therapy anymore. It costs about $400 a pop. It's given as a subcut injection twice a year. The very important thing with denosumab to remember is that once you start denosumab, it's really for life because when you stop denosumab, patients lose bone density very rapidly and in fact can have uh, vertebral fractures. So that's something to keep in mind. So in that sense, denosumab really is the right treatment of choice for patients with significant renal impairment because they're on that limited lifespan already. I'll tell you a little bit about, um, so this is just a meta-analysis. I won't take you through that right now. You can read it in your own time. Uh, maybe I'll just tell you a little bit about romosuzumab. It's not available in New Zealand, not registered yet, but it's available in Australia. And it's probably the only treatment that has both osteoblast enhancing and osteoclast uh, suppressing activity. It's given as a monthly injection, set of two injections, and it's for 12 months. Um, there are side effects such as cardiovascular side effects, osteonecrosis jaw, and atypical thigh fractures. Atypical subtrochanteric fractures are what you see with bisphosphonate therapy, especially if patients have been on prolonged treatment um, with bisphosphonate therapy, and hence the need for a drug holiday to, to minimize the risk of those side effects. So as I said, this is not yet available in New Zealand, but probably will become available. The other thing with denosumab is that we are pushing very hard to um, lower the threshold for donosumab because we, we think about 20% of the patients are missing out that should be actually on treatment. As you know, a lot of patients who've got renal impairment don't meet the funding criteria because it's their first fracture and they really have no option if they can't get funding for donosumab. A lot of patients decide to self-fund. Um, I think it costs about $300 per injection or something like that. And they just need two injection, injections a year. Quite often you will see me ask, when I report a bone density, if somebody has low Z scores, so Z scores under minus two, as you know, T scores are bone density compared to the per patient's bone density compared to a young, healthy, mean, mean um, adult. Um, and it, T score of minus 2.5 or less is considered osteoporosis. Minus one to minus two is considered osteopenia. Z score is bone density of the patient compared to their own age. 
So if people have low Z scores under minus two, then they're likely to have a secondary cause. And you'll often see in my report, please do secondary um, screen uh, because someone has Z scores under minus two. And these are the things that I mean. And I will always mention them. So in addition to routine blood tests, check serum, calcium, phosphate, thyroid function, PTH, cortisol, celiac antibodies, protein electrophoresis, for men, testosterone, vitamin D levels for men and women. So you will you will see that in my report. I'll actually mention the secondary uh, osteoporosis screen. And often you might get a letter from the fracture liaison service as well. This is this that that last slide was about follow-up and drug holidays and, and recurrent fracture, what to do. I'll just tell you a little bit about a fracture liaison service because you must be getting letters from a fracture liaison service. So fracture liaison service was established in New Zealand about 10 years ago. Certainly at counties, we've had it for 10 years. And it essentially revolves around a, a coordinator coordinating care for patients who've already had a uh, on minimal trauma fracture. So it's a 50 year or older person who has a minimal trauma fracture. The role of the fracture liaison service is to identify them and then take them through a series of either need, if they need a scan to organize a scan, if they need treatment to recommend treatment, if they recognize there's a secondary cause, possibility, then recommend secondary screening. If they're fallers, then arrange false prevention strategies such as referring them to the strength and balance program, et cetera. And they have six clinical standards that they really work towards. They identify the fracture, instigate in investigations, inform the patient, suggest interventions such as false prevention and uh, uh, osteoporosis treatment, integrate them into the Australia New Zealand Fragility Fracture Registry, which started in 2022. And then, of course, the quality. So it's monitoring of the service. These are the six standards that uh, pin the fracture liaison service. And to be honest, um, most GPs are the, the most effective fracture liaison service because they know their patients. And essentially, you guys do all of it yourselves anyway. So hopefully the fracture liaison service can actually provide you with some support. And you, you, I'm, I'm sure most of you receive letters from the fracture liaison service informing you um, uh, about uh, screening and so on for your patients. Uh, at, in, you, in, um, in counties, we actually officially started in February 2016, but in fact, we started two years prior to that. I won't talk, talk too much about this, but the, there we have two coordinators. Both of them are ex-orthopedic nurses. We've had physiotherapists do that role in the past. In fact, our current coordinators are the sixth that we've had, um, and I meet with them on a weekly basis. Um, so I might just stop here now and uh, open the floor to questions. So thank you so much for speaking. We do have a couple of questions here. Um, if a patient requires a DEXA, every three years or so from their 30s. Would you, is it, do you, would you have any concerns about that? Is there any other methods of monitoring that you would suggest that people are requiring it from such a young age? I guess because the osteoporosis guidelines have some really effective flow charts, as you showed before, to uh, when you would suggest someone might require a DEXA scan. But I, I guess if there was ever any time outside of that, people could refer you just for uh, specialist advice. Is that right? So you could ask quite specific questions relating to particular cases um, rather than just directly referring them for a scan? Yeah, absolutely. And of course, at counties, we are very lucky because we have geriatricians like myself and La, Dr. La. Mm -hmm. And we also have Dr. Brandon Orwalker, who is endocrinologist, and he deals with referrals under 65. So between the three of us, hopefully we can help you with some advice. Um, because I, I, DEXA service is becoming very tight, especially since we've taken on the fracture liaison service additionally. So, mm -hmm. but we're very happy to advise, absolutely. Okay. Awesome, thank you, Senator. And um, would you be able to outline the, the criteria for the ACC funded DEXAs? Because uh, as you were mentioning on that slide before, not everyone has the same e-referral process. Yeah, so at counties, the our DEXAs are not funded by ACC. They're just uh, funded by the Health of Older People Department. But I understand some ACCs in the process of establishing some guidelines. Um, and 
it might be worth checking with your own so if you are from i'm i'm assuming the gps here from places other than auckland is that right yeah yeah mid central yeah, okay so it might be worth the uh, my best suggestion would be to find your fracture liaison service coordinator in your area and go through them they they will have the knowledge about the funding criteria for your dexter so okay. every hospital now has a fracture liaison service coordinator and um and they they will also have access to their local clinicians yeah but of course at counties the e referral to older people's health will get get your referral to us okay and and why is um denosumab widely used in australia even for the non renal failure patients Do, is there a um question as to whether it is more superior to Fosamax or um, what are your thoughts on the Denosumab? Yeah, that's really interesting. I think I think they're just richer than us, Katie. That's, <laughs> that's the only answer can I can give you. It, it's a it's um it's a bit of a yeah, it's interesting because I think they it, Denosumab really should be used for patients that are at the end of their life because if you have to stop Denosumab then you're really putting them at risk of vertebral fractures. And I think Australia, that's what they're struggling with. Sometimes they've used denosumab as the first line treatment because I suppose it's easier as well. It's just a subcut yeah. injection twice a year. Yeah. So I think it's very nice. They don't have to go for intravenous option and so on and so forth. So it's an easy thing to do. Mm. But of course, there's a price to pay in yeah. the sense that if they ever have to stop it for a reason, then they run the risk of uh, fractures. So I can't tell you why it's first-line therapy in Australia. I think it's just because money is easy there. Yeah. And I guess if, if for whatever reason they did need to stop the denosumab, how easy is it to transition them onto an alternate option? Because, I mean, obviously there'll be a reason in New Zealand why we would be putting them onto the denosumab, but if they can't tolerate the denosumab for whatever reason. Yeah, that's a really interesting question because... Yeah. I'm just thinking here, yeah, the options become very limited because clearly in New Zealand, you're only going to give denosumab to patients that cannot have bisphosphonate because of renal impairment. Mm -hmm. So clearly bisphosphonate won't be an option. Yeah. I mean, then we'll have to think about things like raloxifen, which are not as reliable treatment, or think about escalation of therapy to Fortio. Now Fortio itself is contraindicated in significant renal impairment. So really it's, uh, options become very limited. And we don't use hormone replacement therapy in the elderly. So, yeah, I think uh, if romosomazumab becomes available, that could be an option. But really, we, we that's why really it is an end-of-life treatment, honestly, yeah. practically speaking. Yeah. Okay. Sometimes with the guidelines, um, and I know I've come against this myself with patients, you look at them and think, it's not really telling me very clearly whether I send my patient for a scan or not. So there is a little bit of um, vagueness, I think, sometimes with the flow chart where you wonder um, how we need to, like how frequently we might need to repeat a DEXA scan after last patient's last treatment to make sure that yeah. they're getting the most effective treatment. So um, yeah, would you be able to talk to the, the flow charts just very quickly? If you've got a patient who's 75 years or older, go ahead and treat them. Um, if you really need a DEXA uh, because the patient won't start treatment or something, you can ask for a DEXA and we will we'll guide you. We'll tell you what to do. Uh, if you've got a patient under 75, they've had a minimal trauma, then definitely you need a DEXA. So definitely ask us. Um, send the referral through. Um, the only other time you should ask for a DEXA is if they've been on treatment for five years with Fosamax or IV uh, Zoledronate for three years, and now you're waiting to decide what to do. So that's when you do a DEXA. Or if there's on steroid therapy, um, for failure, my suggestion would be if you're starting them on high dose steroids for prolonged periods of time, start them on bisphosphonate therapy at the same time, and then I'll, I'll go ahead and ask for DEXA because DEXA will take time and they lose bone density in the meantime. Yeah. Worst comes to worst, if they have normal bone density, you can always stop it. So, you know, do that. Do the vitamin D, do the bisphosphonate therapy. Um, and uh, 
really the only other time to do dexa would be if somebody's had a fracture while on treatment and you want to escalate therapy now outside of that um if you think somebody needs a dexa you can refer and we might use that opportunity to guide you and give you an opinion certainly at counties we can do that and i yeah. would think at most hospitals there will be a clinician pathway that you will be able to um consult somebody if you're not very clear about what to do mm -hmm. yeah does that yeah. hopefully that answers your question no it does thank you so much sanita i really appreciate that um we will move on to guy now we've we've run out of time for the q and a but i really appreciated um your talk and the, your your the opportunity to have this conversation with you thank you so much um all right guy you're up hey thank you katie kia ora koutou. um yeah my, my name is guy morris i work in urgent care and i was asked to do a talk about ankle injuries and in this time slot it's too big a topic to cover uh, in, in its entirety. So what I'm going to focus on here is just an approach to ankle injuries to support GPs who are doing after hours commitments in an urgent care clinic every so often, um, or that will potentially help uh, the ankle injuries, the acute ankle injuries that come in through the door. So we're looking at day one ankle, um, ankle injuries and just trying to think of an approach that can help safety net uh, as best as possible to catch uh, everything that um, that, that we might want to catch on that day one. Um, so, so yeah, as I said, just to consider a simple and repeatable approach to ankle injuries that come through urgent care to enable an efficient management while mitigating those misdiagnoses and, and just thinking a little bit about follow-up. So it's important to say I'm not an orthopedic surgeon. So uh, the way I approach these are which of these injuries need to see an orthopedic surgeon either on day one or potentially in early follow-up. So that's my first cohort. Um, I'm acknowledging that some ankle fractures are managed in the community or an awful lot of ankle fractures are managed in community fracture clinics. So which ones need to go there? Um, also, physiotherapists manage an awful lot of ankle injuries in the community. Um, so I, I've, we've got to think about when to use them and um, kind of recognizing when it's um, sensible to play for time. If you're unsure, that kind of caution versus valor approach. So this just simplifies my the way my brain thinks on this one, ankle day one. Um, there are some that need to go to orthopedics same day, and there are some that you can frankly discharge with either no follow-up or potentially with some physio uh, follow-up. And then there's this cohort in the middle that are either confirmed fractures that you need to uh, review within a time window. So they're, they're um, fractures that you've identified that don't need orthopedics on the same day. Uh, but but they obviously need following up. But there's also that cohort of people who you're unsure about, and they're the ones that um, hopefully the, this approach will will ensure that we keep a hold of them, so that we can follow them up and and maybe pick up on some of the little hidden occult things that are going on, or, or make sure that we don't miss unstable injuries. And our options are obviously are uh, following up through orthopedic clinics, an urgent care fracture clinic, or through through a physio as well. Um, so this is this is an approach that I think um, it will capture most of what we need to be be um, uh, picking up. So before you even see the patient uh, or lay hands on the patient, considering the mechanism of injury is the first thing that really lights my kind of red flags off. If somebody has simply just rolled their ankle on a on a flat surface, uh, a simple mechanism of injury like that, then I'm much less concerned than somebody who's had a significant force through their ankle, particularly kind of rotational, externally rotated forces like on a, a snowboard, um, somebody coming off a motorbike and putting their foot in a hole and, and um, or, or somebody who stepped on a ball and then and rolled off from a height or a slide tackle where that somebody else coming in adds that extra force. So any time that the ankle has been given a really good um, a really good force, uh, particularly eversion and external rotation forces, then, then my spider senses are tingling at that, just at that mechanism of injury. Uh, then the, the question of weight bearing, whether they weight bear initially um, or if they're weight bearing when you see them, uh, that's, that, that would have my um, senses uh, going if, they, if the patient can't weight bear. And obviously if it's an open injury or neuro, neurovascularly unstable injury, then, then, then you're, you're going to be alerted early. Um, then it's important when you're looking um, to consider the swelling in particular and medial swelling there is very important. Uh, lateral swelling is, is very common in an ankle roll, but if there's medial swelling, again, before I've touched the patient, I'm, I'm feeling a little bit um, cautious. 
And perhaps maybe it's a little bit later that ecchymosis kicks in, um, but certainly if it's a day or two later, you're, you're definitely looking under the foot for ecchymosis as, as part of your sort of inspection, um, and that and that's a, a, a potential red flag. But then when you get on to feeling, the, the, the thing that I think a lot of people forget to do, and it's my first uh, bit of the body I touch when I'm examining an ankle, is palpate the proximal fibula. Give it a good squeeze, make sure it's not tender. If it is tender, then that person needs full length uh, x-rays, not just ankle views. We'll talk more about that in a second. Um, and then I squeeze down uh, down the leg. Um, and when I get down to that distal um, tib fib region where that uh, syndesmosis is, I'm giving that a good squeeze and making sure I'm looking at the patient's face and seeing if they're sore. You'll often see swelling there as well, but um, there are other tests you can do to test the syndesmosis, including a, a fairly simple external rotation stress test. Um, but I think if you've given that a good squeeze and they've gone ow, then, then that should be lighting a flag. And then palpating, it's very important to obviously follow the Ottawa guidelines when palpating ankles and the lateral malleolus uh, is the most common uh, place they'll be sore. But it's very important to palpate medially and, and not just for bony tenderness that the Ottawa guidelines tell you to, um, try and palpate for any tenderness that might be involving the medial ligament complexes. Um, because if they've got tenderness medially, then, then again, I'm getting suspicious. The navicular and fifth metatarsal are part of the uh, Ottawa rules, but then whilst you're down in the foot, uh, palpating around that first and second intermetatarsal space is very important, as well as then confirming neurovascular status. Um, moving the ankle on day one, if they're very, very sore, you might not get much out of that. So um, that's just at the, at the bottom there. I don't tend to take too much um, sway on that on day one. So um, these are the Ottawa ankle rules as shown by MD Calc. And if you look at them, they're, they're great rules for determining if somebody needs an ankle x-ray or more importantly, probably for diagnosing a uh, an ankle sprain without using radiology. And I think if you follow them, that's great. But um, as you can see there, it, it shows six centimeters of the posterior, uh, lateral and medial malleolus, uh, the navicular, the fifth metatarsal. Um, so tenderness there will require an X-ray, um, but also ability to wait there both immediately and at the, the time that you're reviewing them. So you can actually have no pain no bony tenderness, but uh, non-weight bearing actually qualifies you for an X-ray, as per the Ottawa. Um, but if you if you look at that, if you follow just this screen here, you would miss the proximal fibula, and you might also maybe not palpate the the Les Frank region that I mentioned before. Um, so the Ottawa ankle rules are great, but just um, don't don't just stick to that. It's not a complete ankle exam. Uh, the Ottawa ankle rules, so that's that's a caution. So th th these are the things that once you've done your exam and you've done the x-ray, these are the things that I've, I think you're sending to orthopedics the same day or you're speaking to them. So obviously any open fracture, fracture dislocations, things requiring MUAs, I, I don't think most of those are going to be missed because they're, they're pretty obvious. They're pretty uh, nastily injured um, ankles and uh, probably if they've called an ambulance would be taken up to, to hospital. Um, and again, with neurovascular compromise, but although I have had some people come in with unstable ankles to an urgent care clinic with numbness and um, and the like so it's not it's not unheard of but they're, they're usually pretty um pretty sore but then we get into the ones where we need to be thinking um both with our examination that we mentioned before and the x-ray the the mason nerve fracture this is the one that you'll pick up if you remember to squeeze the proximal fibula because it's a proximal fibula fracture with a medial ankle injury um, so this one Proximal pain and also your medial ankle pain and swelling in your exam will have you thinking about mesonerve. nerve. The Lis Frank is the is the first and second metatarsal uh, space that um, that you'll have palpated, um, and a little bit more about that in, in a minute. Um, Weber B fractures potentially need to be referred on the day. All Weber Cs and uh, bimalleolar and trimalleolar fractures. Uh, Salter Harris three, four, five including the TLO fracture, and, and also any fracture that you've had a chat to orthopedics about and they say send up, uh, obviously that, that it's their, that's their say. Um, so these are, the, these are the ones that we'll just quickly run through now. So, uh, so this is the mason nerve. You can clearly see there there's a proximal fibula fracture. And on this particular case from Radiopedia, there is a medial malleolus uh, fracture as well, but it doesn't have to have 
a, a bone component, you can have a medial ankle complex, uh, a ligament complex injury without bone injury. So the risk here would be that if you didn't x-ray proximally and you just x-rayed the ankle, uh, it might look bony from a bony point of view that it's normal. So really, if you've palpated the proximal fibula and you've paid attention to that medial ankle, both swelling and tenderness, then your brain is halfway there and the, the radiology then confirms it. So um, so the Mason nerve is the full length x-rays are required and, and usually fairly obvious when you when you see them. Uh, Liz Frank, it's not obviously an ankle, but I think um, important that, that I sort of mention it in the same breath because the, the Ottawa rules does include midfoot exam. And the important thing here is that um, if the patient can't weight bear and they've got pain there and, um, and you do an x-ray that isn't weight bearing, that uh, space that you can see on the right there that widens may not widen until they put pressure through um, through the through the foot. So um, pain in that region and non-weight bearing, again, are two of the, the things that we mentioned before, but that would have me concerned. Um, and and you, you might need to x-ray these again a little bit later when they can weight bear or arrange other imaging. So this is the weather classification um, on the top there, nice and normal. And then the Weber A. The Weber A fracture um, is a lateral malleolus fracture, usually uh, just below uh, the level of the, um, the, the joint there. And as you can see there, it doesn't um, involve any of the medial uh, ligament complexes or the syndesmosis. So it's, it's a pretty stable fracture. So these are usually managed conservatively with either cast or boot and, and community uh, follow-up. Weber B, you can see there it's slightly higher up at the level of the joint um, ankle joint and it does just start to involve some of the syndesmosis um, and so a Weber B injury with some medial injury is where you start getting into a gray area between whether or not these are managed conservatively or, or, or um, operatively whereas the Weber C there you can see is a much higher uh, fracture there on the on the fibula it's taken out the syndesmosis and there's either a medial fracture or a medial ligament injury. And so that ankle is very unstable. So um, A's are stable, B's can be, but cannot be, and C's are unstable. And um, that shows the Weber A. Uh, you can easily see that's nice and um, that, that fracture there going uh, nice and below the, the joint line there, uh, nice stable fracture. Um, and this is a, a stable Weber B. Uh, the, Case that I took this from on Radiopedia said that there was no medial pain, no uh, no no swelling, and that the uh, the talus there hasn't shifted media on the medial side, uh, and you can see the fracture there at that level, consistent with the Weber B. So so this might this would be a stable Weber B, whereas the next one um, is the unstable, and you can see where the arrow is there. That uh, that space has widened because. The talus has shifted. You can even sort of tell that that fragment of the, the distal fibula has, has also um, shifted. And the case report said that this person was tender medially. So with the Weber Bs, that's why examining the medial ankle is so important because it, if you've got a Weber B with medial pain, then that's somebody that orthopedics should be spoken to about. If they haven't got medial pain and the, there's no shift, then that's probably a stable injury that you manage uh, con uh, conservatively. And the Weber C on the next slide, where you can see that, that much higher up there on the fibula, there's some widening um, uh, immediately as well. And so the Weber C is yeah, straight straight to orthopedics. Uh, the next one I've put in just because it's a, a subtle Salter Harris II. The Salter Harris II fractures do tend to get managed in the, uh, the community. They're not um, they're not something that needs uh, orthopedic input. Uh, but that to me. It, it, it was reported as such, and you can see, if you look closely, there is a little bit of a, uh, an anomaly there just in the metaphysis uh, above the, the physis there on the lateral malleolus. Um, but I would imagine that this kid probably is struggling to put weight through the ankle. And so, uh, again, if, if you had a child who wasn't weight bearing and had lateral tenderness, um, and you maybe didn't pick this up on the x-ray, then by by following the sort of, well, they're not weight bearing, let's be cautious approach, then then you might pick this up either in the, the fracture clinic review or the um, the x-ray report. Um, the next slide just shows the Salter Harris as a reminder, um, the normal top left, the, the type one where the um, fracture just goes through the physis and the type two where it goes through the physis and then through the, the metaphysis. Um, those are, are, are inherently managed um, 
without um, unless they need manipulating if, if they're um certain types of salt harris twos might um but but in in the ankle there that, that that's not the case but the um ones on the bottom there three four and five these need orthopedic input so the uh, fracture of a three goes through the physis and then through the um, epiphysis the four goes through um the, the, all three goes through metaphysis physis epiphysis and then the uh, type five it's got scrunched together and, and and squished together like a like a sponge so um the bottom three you're, you're referring and on the next uh, slide there's an example of a of a salter harris three um it's a called a telo fracture there's the, the lateral tibia there there's a there's a chunk going up through the the um the epiphysis uh, and so yeah, if you saw that you'd be referring but that child's probably not weight bearing either uh, on that um moving on for for time uh, the, uh, appropriately to the tincture of time um so this is really referring to the ones that you're going to on day one send home but with a plan to bring back. So you're using time either as a treatment for a stable injury that you know is there, um, but also it's useful for buying you a little bit of time to establish whether or not someone has a more serious injury. So if, if the x-rays look normal, but these um, patients have had significant syndesmotic pain or medial ankle pain, or they're non-weight bearing, or it was a mechanism of injury that made you feel like th th this isn't quite, quite right, then these are the ones that by putting them in uh, in either a cast or a moon boot um, and crutches as needed and arranging some kind of follow-up with orthopedics or, or an urgent care fracture clinic um, or potentially a physio if you if you um, kind of have a relationship where you can guarantee that the patient's going to be seen, then, um, uh, then, then that's the best way to have these patients reviewed in about five to seven days um, and making sure that you've put your concerns in the notes and just as an example i saw a kid a couple of weeks ago who'd stood on a, on a, a football rolled their ankle came in and they had a lot of pain medially laterally and um and syndesmotically the x-ray looked normal but they weren't weight bearing and i put them in a cast and they came back to our fracture clinic and the person who saw them um, noted that, that when they came out of the cast they felt way better they started to put weight through it the repeat x-ray was a weight bearing x-ray and everything looked fine um, and so uh, it was sort of de-escalated from there and and i uh, was relieved for the patient and it, and i'd kind of used the same analogy as if you referred somebody with a, a mole that was suspicious or a breast lump that was suspicious um, and then you find out that it was a benign lesion and, and there was nothing to worry about it's the same as that we can't make every referral can't be um, be perfect, but we're making referrals such that we don't miss uh, miss things. So, so we have to accept that some some won't have any significant pathology. But I think if you kind of follow these these sorts of rules, then then we're not going to miss the the, the more significant ones. Very quickly to mention physios because all sprains, frankly, benefit from physios and and certainly the rehab of of some stable fractures uh, as well. Um, and I try to encourage any moderate severe sprain with normal x-rays uh, to, to be seeing a physiotherapist um, and sports people, active active kids, farmers, builders, you know, people who really need a strong ankle. Um, the issue, I guess, with um, physiotherapy is in, in the, the trio of things that I had on the previous slides, where that when I make a referral to orthopedics, I get a, a, a confirmation that um, that an appointment is going to be made or I get an acknowledgement when I put somebody into our urgent care fracture clinic I, I know that they've got that appointment and that the person will chase whereas um, with physio you don't have that same that same guarantee so you, you've got to be careful not to lose people by saying go to physio and, and they disappear just very quickly the, the the discharging ones are effectively to a negative ankle so walking well um i i um i think physio follow-up for for most other ankles are important and, and the physios will pick up on anything that's lingering just a very quick caution because moon boots are often used a little bit um as a as a safe option put someone in a moon boot 
The problem is that if the patient goes off and just wears it for a long time, they're going to get very um, stiff and maybe avoid uh, follow up and, and cause more problems. So it's very important that um, there is a plan with the moon boot to be reviewed somewhere within that first week that the patient is educated how to use it, how to remove it, how to keep the foot and ankle moving um, and that it isn't um, uh, something that they, they should be in for too long without review. Um, so to summarize on the next slide, um, the, I think if you're aware of the mechanism of injury, let that light the first um, beacon of concern. Uh, be aware about patients non-weight bearing. Um, never forget to palpate the proximal fibula and squeeze the distal tib fib syndesmosis looking for pain. Always look for medial tenderness and, and swelling. And then remember to palpate the list frank. Um, obviously, if you see a fracture and you're unsure if it's stable or not, ask ortho. And if you've done all these other things and you and they say, are they tender medially? And you say yes, then that will help guide their advice. Um, but that treatment, if you've got concerning features and nothing on the x-ray, then treating and reviewing is a good way to avoid anything that might be more significant in there. Um, and, um, and you know, the, the, use your physios and, and the moon boot. With caution, um, the next slide just has that that final approach again. Just um, the the in red, the the key things that I think we need to be looking for. And on the final uh, slide, just the resources: Radiopedia, Ortho Bullets, and MD Calc are great. That paper that I've mentioned there is interesting to me because it showed that there was an eightfold increase in um, an ankle being unstable, an ankle fracture being unstable in patients who couldn't weight bear on that ankle fracture immediately. So if you've got someone with a broken ankle and there was no weight bearing immediately after they did it, then uh, that should be making you think that it, that it could be an unstable injury and maybe involving an orthopedic surgeon is, is, um, is wise, at least in the follow-up context. Long, no, that's okay. squeeze, then. <laughs> We've got time for a couple of questions. So, um, sure. does prolonged use of a moon boot come with an increased risk of DVT? I guess that's one of the concerns because if the patient is wearing it there and not taking it off, then it is a, a cast effectively. And so, uh, plaster casting is the same. So, one of the reasons to get them out is and, and moving would be to mitigate against against that as well. Um, but you, you do hear stories about people with a, a non-weight bearing ankle injury, normal x-rays, <clears throat> excuse me, put into a, a moon boot and then they sort of disappear and they're lost to follow up. And the, the bit I mentioned about physio is that you can tell a patient to go to physio, but there isn't any, you, you've really got to make damn sure that they go to the physio. Otherwise, they may just drift off and, and self-manage in the moon boot. Um, so yeah, having a relationship with a physio clinic that you can ensure that these are reviewed in is, is important or bring them back to an urgent care clinic or, or your GP clinic, somebody to um, ensure that they've been reviewed and are they still non-weight bearing? Do they still have pain? Get the repeat x-rays. Um, but yeah, if you if you just go off and wear your moon boot for, for six weeks without taking it off, I, I would imagine it's exactly the same risk as a, as a, a plaster cast from a DVT point of view. And it sort of leads into um, another question that someone's asked is the benefit between a backslab versus a moon boot. And I guess with a backslab, you're less likely to lose, lose them to follow. Yes. <laughs> yeah. You definitely, you're, you're sort of putting a handcuff on them slightly, although yeah. patients can, can always cut them off. Or um, I have had a patient cut a, a fiberglass cast off with a, an angle grinder before, which was, which was um very dangerous um but yeah you are sort of you are locking them in a little bit more with that um but they are um they are, they are uh, i think they're a little bit more comfortable so the kid that we put in the other day um just felt immediately more comfortable and we knew that he wasn't going to start putting weight and running around on it and and just being a kid with a with a moon boot on so it, it's um yeah it, it's uh it, if, if you've got a fracture that you know needs to be locked up and is going to see orthopedics, then then a, 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 fracture, um, a cast is obviously better as well. Brilliant. Awesome. Well, I would love to pick your brain some more, Guy, but it's now time for Sue's uh, clinical updates. So thank you so much for speaking. I okay. really appreciate no it. Over to you, Sue. Thank you, Katie. The first story is a good news story that Health New Zealand Whareawa has supplied free access to... BMJ best practice and to Dynamed. 
This is temporary, so it's only there until September. So please use it because if everybody uses it and finds it useful, then it will, will probably stay there longer. And where you find it is on health pathways. And if you go to the pathway and look on the right hand side, you will see that it's listed there. While we're there, we can also see that button that says send feedback. And I just wanted to talk to you about that as well, because these buttons are on every page. And the pages are, are reviewed on a regular basis so that they, they do get updated, but sometimes things happen in clinical practice between these updates. So if you're aware of some changes that have happened in an area that you feel confident on, please let us know. And just, it's very quick to do the send feedback and the Pathways team will look into that. So even if you're not sure, just alert us. And speaking about the homepage with those Pathways on the top, right hand corner you'll often find other useful information on on there I know on the contraception pages there's all your consent forms sitting up the top there so just have a look around your health pathways now another topic I've been asked to just mention to you is that there are some pathways that have not been adapted to your area and they'll look a bit like this they'll be bright yellow and they'll have that border on top of it in a dark yellow so these pathways still provide really useful information, but because they're not adapted to your area, then please don't use the referral processes. There has been some incidents where that's caused a delay in compromised care. So we just wanted to make that very clear to people. Now, talking about COVID care, you will probably know that the it's COVID care has now changed to usual patient care and funding for COVID management all stopped on the 30th of June. Pharmacies are funded if they supply COVID medications. So ph some pharmacies are no longer doing this because of the time investment in assessing patients that may not, not then go on to require a prescription. So there's a, a list of the pharmacies that are doing this on Health Point and the Health Pathways. Also, the delivery of COVID medications has now changed and pharmacies are no longer funded to do that. Some pharmacies were already delivering medications and so the usual delivery charges and mechanisms will remain. COVID vaccines remain funded. So for all people from 30, and this is a standalone payment. Now, what that means is if you're giving multiple vaccinations on the day, you can claim for the COVID vaccine separate to the other ones. And it's for anyone who has been six months from their previous dose or from a COVID-related illness. The other people that can get an extra booster are your six months to 11 year olds who are at risk of severe illness, who have not had a booster since their primary course. So that's just one booster for them. Your 12 to 29 year olds at risk of severe illness who are six months from their previous dose of vaccine or from a COVID-19 illness are also eligible for ongoing vaccination. RATs are funded until September of this year. It's not clear whether that funding will go on or not at this point, but performing the RATs tests, which we were doing in our practices, is no longer funded. The COVID-specific help, helplines have ceased and the use of the COVID care CCCM module is going to stop as of um, the in the 1st of August, it will be decommissioned. Plus the notifications that go from my health record into your inbox. Pharmacy co-payments. So again, this changed from the 1st of July and you're probably aware of it, but just in case you've missed that, there is a $5 charge. It's waived for people 13 or younger for people holding community services cards 
for people over 65 and for people with a prescription subsidy card. Now, you get a prescription subsidy card if you've had 20 new prescriptions for an individual or if they're linked as a family for that entire family. And this rolls over on the 1st of February next year, so people need to start paying again for their prescriptions at that point. And there's still some prescriptions that will carry that $15 or $10 co-payment, if, particularly if they've come from a private um, specialist. HPV funding. Just a reminder to particularly think of the women and people with a cervix who are aged 70 to 75, who have not ever been screened or have not had two consecutive normal cervical cytologies between the ages of 62 and, and 69. And for those that have had that have not had an HPV not detected in the last five years. All Wahini Maori and Fano with a cervix aged 25 to 69 are funded. All Pacific women and people with a cervix aged 25 to 69 are funded. And all women aged 25 to 69 who hold a community services card are funded. All follow-up testing is funded. And all people who are under screened are also funded for their cervical screening. So that's people who haven't had a screen if they've been recommended to have one in, in three years, and that's our immuno, immunocompromised people. People who were recommended to have a screen in five years are funded if they're two years outside that. And people who have had different um, recommended intervals so that if they were still on the previous screening program and it's been two years since they had been advised to have a screen, they are funded as well. Now, I just want to mention the section on from Pharmac. I think most of you know that Silazapril is not going to be available anymore from the 1st of January. It will be fully delisted. But from October, the stocks of the 0.5 and 2.5 will expire. And from November, the five milligram tablets will be out of stock. And I've just put in here a table to remind you of the dose equivalents if you're transferring people off Silazapril. I think most of us have done this already, but just in case there's, a, well, there's still a, a few prescriptions out there. Good news from Pharmac that the Effudex, the issue we had with supply has now resolved, so they're available. Morphine liquid, the five milligram and 10 milligram per mil is still out of stock. The one milligram per mil and two milligram per mil strength is available. No pharmacists will be prescribing those bigger doses using the two milligram per mil strength. So just please make sure that your patients are aware to check the dose that they actually need to take, depending on which um, form of elixir that they're getting. And more good news, from the 1st of August, a new range of supplements for people with inherited metabolic diseases will be available. So that's, for example, people with fetoketonuria. So they're going to be funded. And also for a, a lot of people that have been concerned about our postmenopausal women and the supply of estradiol patches, the estradiol gel will be becoming available and feedback is being sought on what needs to happen, what activities are needed to support people changing from the patches to the gel or starting the gel in the first place and what support health professionals might need to prescribe this gel and what activities we need just to help people access this. So this is, a, you've not got a lot of time to get back to Pharmac on this. It closes on the 1st of August, so two days. But if you um, would like to contribute to the feedback, but Pharmac would be very grateful to hear from you. And there are no other changes proposed to other forms of um, menopausal replacement therapy currently list listed. 
So good news on that one. So any questions? So thank you for that. Um, so there is a question here just about advanced prescriptions for Paxlovid. Are they still going to be funded? No, they're not. No. Sorry. Okay. Uh, any ETA on estradots? Once they've got the feedback, I think the plan is to get this available very soon. Okay. Well, if that's all the questions for tonight, I think it is about time to wrap up. And Thank you so much to everyone um, for speaking tonight. Your expertise uh, is always appreciated. And thank you to everyone for joining us. Have a lovely night, everyone. Kakite.